When you look at the pandemic, the lockdown, and the kind of recession we're left with, how difficult will it be to get back on our feet? I believe it's just going to take quite a bit, quite a long time for us to get fully back to, uh, let's say, the 2019 levels. Um, we still have not witnessed the full impact on small and medium businesses. On the other hand, we've seen large corporations having full access to the capital markets, and we've had a profound change from the depth of, of uh, the third week of March, where most companies have had the ability to access liquidity and capital. Uh, even this week, American Airlines is. Back in March, we were questioning the viability of some airlines. Um, and so large corporations had a great ability to stabilize their, their uh, financial position. And now the question is, how fast can these industries, can all industries reboot itself to, to, to more of a normal business model? Um, I do believe Americans and throughout the world, people want to find some source of normalcy. And that normalcy is, you know, everybody wants, and we have some governmental leaders focusing on those issues. And the real debate will be, can we have a society that becomes a society that was highly compassionate to a society that is more pragmatic? And right now, the marketplace is, is looking at a more pragmatic society. It is accepting a higher infection rate, which then will lead to some higher mortality. And that's going to be a balance. How much can society bear the rise of infection rates, which in many cases may be good because we have a higher percent of our population that have maybe have the antibodies. Uh, and so that's going to be the real issue. And, and if we can have a more normalized economy sooner, then I think the marketplace is validated by the, by the by its prices. Now, on the other hand, if we see rising infection rates in the coming weeks or months, and we have to go backwards again, and we have to find a way to become more compassionate, then um, the markets are probably ahead of themselves. And so these are going to be the real questions about where we are related to um, the the, the rate of disease and the need for normalcy. Um, and I think these are very hard questions. I was actually asked by a, a, a leading politician, um, a governmental leader, and asked the question, what should they do? Should they be more pragmatic or more compassionate? Uh, and these are very hard questions, harder questions for democracies uh, than they are for autocratic countries. Um, and so we'll see how this plays out. It may play out very well in one country and it may play out poorly in another country. But I don't think we have enough information to know. At the same time, we have our, we have the, um, the science related to antivirals, the science towards um, yeah. some form of uh, vaccination. And that will lead to more normalcy the faster we have those types of protocols. You know, Larry, we talk about a V-shaped recovery. We talk about W-shaped recovery. Is it, you know, because we're just testing and, and going along to see if the infection rates go up, how do you think that recovery will look like? Is it going to be very patchy or because we fell so hard, it'll be quicker to go up? I think some industries are going to be quicker to come up. I think some uh, industries are going to be slower to come up. Um, you know, I've been to different um I was in Colorado this past weekend, and they 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 opened up more, but in, and opening up means only maybe let's say at a restaurant they could only eat outside. These owners of restaurants are still not making a living. They they may be breaking even. They may be able to help their employees have make some living, uh, but that that does not give them the you know obviously normalcy yet. And so this is what I'm trying to suggest. We don't know the real impact on small and medium businesses yet. We don't, you know, uh, is there going to be a need for another fiscal stimulus to help these, you know, the large component of small and medium businesses? As I said, large companies in many cases have been already been able to stabilize their financial um, position. Uh, so I don't know how this is all going to play out. And um, I'm optimistic, though, that we are going to find antivirals. I'm optimistic we'll find some form of vaccination. Is it in six months or a year or two years? I can't answer that. What will be the long-term implication of this crisis on BlackRock? How, how many people will come back to work? How many people work from home? What does it mean for your clients and customers? 
great question. Uh, we're asking that question all the time. Right now, we are, are we have in some of our Asian cities now, we have our employees coming back to work to 50 percent. Uh, we are going to reboot some of our uh, locations in Europe where 50 percent will come to work. And we're going to, over the course of the summer, we'll see how we reboot some of our offices in the United States. The key will be, uh, though, is, is public transportation safe? In the United States and in the UK, where we have our concentration in cities that, that uh, rely on public transportation. And so that's going to be the big question. And every CEO I talk to in London or in San Francisco or New York, that is the big question being raised right now. But I, I actually believe there's some optimism related to COVID and how we're, how we're working. Many companies, including BlackRock, have been able to operate with 99% of our employees remotely very successfully. I don't enjoy it. I don't enjoy the, the, the aspect of, of working via video. I enjoy the physicality of being in an office and, and walking down hallways and talking to people. I don't know if we have those inspirational moments via video. I don't know if we have that aha idea, uh, but we're operating quite successfully. I do believe when we have a more normalized world, in other words, some form of vaccination, I don't believe any most companies are going to have 100% of employees back to the office. I believe it's going to be a blessing, a positive, that we could be highly productive at home, that we could have a component of our population working remotely. And working remotely does not mean working remotely living in, a, in the same city or the same suburb. It may mean working a, a thousand miles away, three weeks a month and one week back in the office, or, or, or working you know, uh, five straight months and a month and a half uh, remotely. I think that's going to turn into a blessing, especially when children are back, uh, back to school and they're more normalized. I think it's going to be fantastic when it comes to sustainability, that we're going to have less, uh, less congestion in cities. And so I actually believe some of this, how we are learning to work, how we're learning to operate, is going to turn into an incredible blessing, and it's going to improve the quality of our, our, our lives. So, um, so there's going to be some very good things out of COVID, despite all the economic terror and uncertainty that it's creating right now. So more sustainability. I know we just had a conversation, Larry Fink, about sustainability and whether COVID-19 and b because the economy is doing so badly will push away some of the goals for sustainability. And you don't think it will. You think, you know, companies will push ahead in, in providing sustainability and just more ESG friendly. Francine, I actually think COVID-19 is another example of physical risk. It's a health risk. It's an economic risk. I think sustainability and climate change is another physical risk. And as I wrote in my letter in January, sustainability is an investment risk. And we see now health is an investment risk, too. And so I think all of this is going to accelerate uh, the desire, the need to understand these issues. So we have not seen any slowdown from our investor interests. In addition, when you, when you intersect sustainability, when you intersect the sustainability of health or COVID, if you intersect most recent issues around racial inequality, it puts more emphasis on every company to be more of a stakeholder organization, a company that is focusing not just on their shareholders, but focusing on their employees their safety, focusing on uh, their clients more and more, uh, and then focusing on every society where they work. And I do believe COVID actually elevates this whole concept of ESG. I think COVID is going to elevate and associated um, um, large issues around racial inequality is going to raise a whole issue of S. And so I believe the demands on public companies, public boards and CEOs, hopefully private companies are going to be all elevated in terms of their role in society in elevating issues around sustainability, issues around social and social injustice. And so I do believe our responsibilities as companies are going to become more important than ever before. So because of the, uh, you know, pandemic impact on social inequality, how will it change the way that you invest in companies? 
Well, in my 2020 letter, we asked companies to report under SASB, and SASB, uh, part of the um, reporting in SASB does, uh, has a whole file on how are you, uh, what is the distribution of your employment and, and by race, by gender. I, I believe more and more companies since my letter came out are now reporting under SASB and TCFD. I think this is all going to be other ways of measuring organizations, measuring management and leadership in terms of, of, of providing a, 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 you know, a better long-term outcome, a more purposeful organization. Um, and I, as I said in my, in, a, in my last three letters, a better, a more purposeful organization has more sustainable profitability. And I believe that more than ever before. I think more and more of our clients are choosing to deal with companies who they believe meet their social, their environmental ideals. And I think this is going to only accelerate. Um, and I think it's going to accelerate as as the young people who are joining the workforce today, and they're going to be joining the workforce, unfortunately, in a remote way in most big companies. Um, they have a totally different experience than what I did, and I do believe the young people are going to actually become more vigorous in promoting these ideals of stakeholder capitalism. You um, or BlackRock also plays is playing a key role in the Fed's rescue of the U.S. economy. What does that mean for BlackRock? Are you now too big to fail? Well, I look at those as two very different concepts. Um, we have been we have been working with five different governments uh, um, over the course of the issues around COVID. Um, you mentioned the Federal Reserve, but four other uh, uh, countries that we've been working with uh, in trying to help them design policies related uh, to um, boost their economies. Um, to me, those are that's a, a division within BlackRock that we've been doing this since 1994. It is a segregated division within our organization. It is what, a component of our organization that I'm very proud of. And the reason why we win these assignments, we actually do a really good job. Um, I'm not here to judge whether we are too big to fail. I mean, I, 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 you know, that we have been reviewed and reviewed and reviewed. Obviously, we are a large, important asset management company. None of the assets are our own assets. This is not our balance sheet. Unlike when people think about banks and insurance companies, it is their balance sheet that is people questioning it. Our clients speak, um, uh, can redeem in their mutual funds and ETFs daily. Our institutional clients generally can re, uh, um, uh, redeem in, in a 30-day period of time. Um, and so our fundamental position within society is very different than what a bank and insurance company is. Our work that we do related to FMA, um, you know, we did this openly minded. We, when we were asked to take on these assignments, you know, people asked, what will this mean? Well, you know, will there be a society backlash? And I said, we need to continue to do our job on behalf of the societies we work for. And, I, and we're winning this because of our expertise. Um, and the compliments that we have received from our clients has been as strong as ever. Um, and so I will continue to try to position ourselves to be uh, the best we can in helping more and more companies, more and more individuals, governments to have a better financial future. And that's what we're trying yeah. to do. A hundred percent of our business model is a fiduciary culture. And that you cannot say that about any bank or insurance company because it is that their balance sheet navigation is not, doesn't. Um, apply related to that fiduciary positioning. Um, we ha have, because it's not our money, we have high standards that we have to operate yeah. under. And I'm very pleased in how we've been able to navigate this. Um, Larry Fink, I mean, 2020 was always going to be a big year because of, you know, the U.S. trying to trade tensions. It's a U.S. election, a lot to do with emerging markets. Now you have COVID-19. What makes you most worried about the markets? Are we going to see a, a lot of volatility as the market tries to figure out exactly what's important and what's not, like cutting out the noise? I think it's going to be very hard to cut out the noise. Um, I think we still don't have a fundamental understanding. Of, is there going to be 
um, a different strain of the virus uh, like we saw in, in, in other parts. I don't know if we are going to have um, a, a severe rising infection rate or mortality rate. Um, I hope that we have antivirals quickly. I hope we have a vaccination quickly. Uh, but until we have those issues, until we're over our, um, um, until we have our, our, um, a better understanding of the outcome of the 2020 election here, and we know what's going on. I think it, we should expect a lot of volatility for the next year. Uh, but let's be clear, markets have done quite well with all this uncertainty. Uh, and there's a huge pile of cash sitting in the sidelines, and that money needs to be put to work.